How should you structure your HTTP API? I'm Derek Colmartin from CodeOpinion.com, and I stumbled upon a video by John O. Williams giving his opinion on what that structure should be. So let's review it, because you know I'm going to have some thoughts. This is going to be a pretty opinionated video, so you might agree with it, you might not. Let me know what you think down below. Now, in terms of folder structure, these are some of the common folder structures that I see people using. So the first example is by technical concerns. So this is like grouping things by what they actually are. And then we commonly see clean slash onion architecture. So like grouping things by like API, application, domain, infrastructure, and managing how those dependencies are pointing in certain directions, usually by creating multiple projects and all that sort of stuff, right? And then this is also what I commonly see is like domain driven design plus vertical slice architecture, where we're grouping things by features, but we're still doing domain driven design. So we have our domain folders with our domain objects and domain services and all that sort of stuff, right? So these are all perfectly valid architectures, folder structures, whatever you want to call them, right? But when All right, let's stop right there. So before I start giving my opinions, I'd like to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. So the first thing we need to do is get out of this mode of looking at project structures and templates as a reasoning for things like domain-driven design. So while I do agree with them that you see these samples of vertical slice architecture or clean architecture with DDD, when you're looking at a template, you have no concept of whether somebody's actually doing domain-driven design in it because it's not dictated by the patterns that you're using. Sir, you may have a domain services, or you may have entities or aggregates, but they're patterns that not don't necessarily relate to whether you're actually doing DDD. They're just patterns. You're just using a certain set of patterns. You could be applying DDD and not even be using any of those patterns. I'll get to that more in a bit. But the first point of this is that these templates and all these things of like, oh, you're doing domain driven design and you're structuring this way, that's really not the case at all. The only thing that we are gonna be using is something like vertical slice architecture where we're grouping by features, but we're not doing domain driven design. So this is how we're gonna be structuring our application. One of the main things that I wanted to achieve with this structure is simplicity. So first off, we have this endpoints file. This endpoints file is gonna give us an overview of our entire API surface. So I don't wanna have to dig through controllers or dig through folders to find all of my use cases in my application, right? I wanna know really easily what my API can actually do. Next up. And that's not a terrible idea. It's basically having a central point where you can see where all ultimately where all the routes are, I guess. We have our common folder. So in any application, you're gonna have some sort of common functionality or some sort of code that you wanna reuse across multiple parts of the code base. This is where you put it. Next up, we have our feature folders. So like vertical slice architecture, we are going to be grouping by feature. So the main point behind vertical slice architecture and using feature folders is things that change together should live together. What does a feature folder look like? Well, it can, it can contain common services that are used across multiple different endpoints. And then we have our endpoints folder. So this is all the endpoints that belong to this particular feature. So this feature group, for example, posts, we could have multiple endpoints such as like get post by ID, delete post, archive post, one important thing to note is each endpoint is going to define their request and response contract. And this is going to be really key in creating that isolated piece of work just for that particular endpoint. And finally, now that's a really interesting point there, which I think people doing this kind of realize is that when you have things like your requests, your responses all together in one central location, you kind of lose what people oftentimes start complaining about is having different DTOs or different layers where you're seemingly mapping from one type to the other, just because it's in a respective layer or folder, is that they're all kind of centralized into one place, which is related to your feature. Finally, we have our data folder. This is probably where I'm going to diverge a little bit from most of the other examples and get a little bit opinionated here and go against the grain because we're not gonna be using domain-driven design. So I've used domain-driven design in the past, it's worked, but it's always felt a little bit too complicated than what it actually needs to be, right? And the main purpose behind this is simplicity. So rather than creating this rich domain model where we're trying to shove our behavior into particular domain objects and then eventually thinking, wait, does this behavior belong in this object or this object? We're gonna be doing the complete opposite of that and just letting data be data. Now I often hear this and it's really common to be thinking of, okay, domain driven design is way too complicated. I've done it in the past. It really doesn't fit what I'm doing and I just want this to be simple. 
That's probably because you were trying to apply the tactical patterns of domain-driven design when you actually didn't have the problems that those patterns were solving, such as having a rich domain model, aggregates, capturing those behaviors, etc. Maybe you just had something simplistic that was CRUD, or even if it did have a little bit of behavior, it could be captured with simple data models and transaction scripts. And people often say that an anemic domain model, really just data models with transaction scripts, is an anti-pattern. I don't believe it is at all. I think it has a use case entirely. The problem is, is when you think you have a rich domain model, when you don't. If you guys wanna take a look at the source code yourself, it is on my GitHub and I will put a link in the description. And if you haven't done so already, you know I have a link to the original video in the description so you can get to that source code as well. But for now, let's open it up in Visual Studio, take a look. So this is our solution. Let's take a look at some of the top level stuff and see how it maps to our overview. So we have our endpoints file here. This is gonna give us the overview of what our API can actually do. We have our data folder, which is gonna contain all of our stuff to do with our database. And it's also gonna have our types. So you can see we have types like post, user, like, comment, all that sort of stuff. And it's essentially just our data mappings, whether you're using an ORM, very likely here, in this case, an entity frame or core. And then we have our common folder, which is gonna contain some of our common logic. And at the moment, all I've really got in here is our API. So we have some common extensions, we have some common filters, and then we have a common endpoint that we're gonna be using across all of our endpoints in our application. And then we have some feature folders, right? We have authentication features, we have comments features, we have posts features, and these are all gonna contain endpoints, right? So if I expand this, you can see our post will have endpoints, and these are all the endpoints that our posts feature contains. Back to what I said in the overview, an endpoint is a self-contained unit of work, and it's really broken down into three things. So the first step is endpoint mapping. So what we're gonna be doing is defining what is the request method, and then what is the route? So in this example, we have a get request and the route is ID. And then also a part of this mapping is we're providing some sort of documentation here. And then we're also mapping an endpoint filter for request validation. And that brings us to the second key thing of endpoints, which is describing the request and response contracts. We have a request and we are required to provide an ID. And then we actually describe the response. So this is gonna be the shape of the data that we're returning from this endpoint. And the final thing, and probably most important, is the actual logic. How are we taking in this request and how are we generating the response? So since we're using minimal APIs, right, we can just provide static methods as our handlers. So I have this handle method and you can see it's returning a okay of type response or it's returning a not found. And since we're using static methods as well and minimal APIs, we can actually inject dependencies into these methods without using constructor injection, for example. And then we just perform our logic, right? So we get our post from our database with the particular ID doing, selecting all the columns that we actually need from our database, and then we are returning our result. So an endpoint is really simple. It's really just broken down into those three things. I like it. It's simple. It actually is very simple, and that's fine. You're just defining your route, how you want to handle that route, and the request, which is ultimately just the HTTP request and the underlying framework, ASP.NET Core, deserializing the actual HTTP request and constructing that into your request object. Then doing the reverse for your response object is basically returning that in a meaningful way that becomes ultimately the HTTP response. It is simple. And I find the simplicity of this refreshing because too often I have to harp against samples that are showing patterns that really don't illustrate them that well because samples are so hard to really illustrate the complexity that you need to apply certain patterns, et cetera. So what the trap kind of here is that we get stuck into maybe using a sample like this or an illustration like this that is very simple in the wrong scenario or vice versa. We have a very simple scenario where we use all these different project structures and are concerned about all these things related to coupling when we don't even really have much coupling. So again, it's kind of this double-edged sword of really understanding what your problem is, the complexity you have, and the patterns that may be applicable to you and do these solve those problems. Now, the one thing I wanted to go over a little bit more was the discussion around the data and just letting data be data. So here we have a post, right? It's just a plain old class with no behaviors whatsoever, just properties. So I think it's totally up to you whenever you want to add behavior to a class. I'm never gonna say don't ever use methods on a class because you're just gonna disadvantage yourself way too much only add behavior when it makes sense. And that works, it's simple. Just a simple transaction script with a data model, ultimately using an ORM. 
But here's an example of things starting to get a little sideways because they're getting more complicated. So as an example, here's our feature to like a post. It works pretty simply. The first thing we're gonna do is just check to see if we've already liked it. If we have, then we're just gonna return okay. Otherwise, we're creating a new like record and we're adding that to our database and we're saving it. Now, where the complexity might lie here eventually over time is because of scale. Let's say somewhere else, which we likely need to do, is show the number of likes on a post. Right now, it's just simply, we have to count the number of rows in our likes for that post. That may not work at scale. So if we ran into those performance and scaling concerns, what we might decide to do is, okay, let's denormalize some data here, and we're gonna add a like count to our actual post. So when somebody does like, we're still gonna add our record, we're still doing everything as normal, but within that same transaction, now what we can do is we're gonna increment our like count that's on the post. So when we fetch any type of post, we immediately have the count. We don't have to make a separate query to count the number of rows. What also might have happened along the way over time as the system evolved is we wanted to add a feature to put, send a push notification to the author of the post so that they know when somebody's liked their post. So to do this, we've created a post liked event that we're gonna publish out to whatever service bus we're using. But what I've done is I've introduced the possibility of creating consistency issues because that denormalizing that like count, that means that everything has to run, absolutely has to run through that API in order to update that like count. If any of our code base, somebody just automatically randomly adds somewhere that's gonna add a record of a like to a post, well, our like count's not gonna increment correctly. So everything has to run through this. So that's maybe where you wanna start encapsulating and adding behavior, maybe to some domain model as the example. Same thing with that event. If you add or increment the like count, but you don't actually publish that uh, post liked event, we're losing functionality there. Especially if we have some other consumer doing something that's integral to some part of the workflow, we're losing consistency. This is where complexity starts forcing you down the road of looking at other patterns rather than just a transaction script that's updating data, doing a bunch of things, and that seems simple. Over time, it can start getting a little bit more hairy, a little bit more complex. So we might end up using a few different patterns to solve the problems that we're having. So maybe we use the repository pattern to get out our aggregate, and our aggregate is our post. Now we're exposing a like method on that post where we can do that increment of that denormalized data. We can have a navigation property here of the child, which is related to our likes, and then we can add our event of post like. We can also be using something behind the scenes that our repository is doing, which is the outbox pattern, which has our consistency of saving our state in our database, as well as guaranteeing that we're gonna be publishing that event, that post liked event. But it doesn't start there. We got there because we had certain problems. It starts in the very simple method that he had in his video, just a transaction script with a data model. It makes sense. It kind of moves differently and evolves if you start having different concerns. In my example, if I didn't have those performance concerns or scaling concerns, then I wouldn't be denormalizing that data. If I wasn't denormalizing that data, I wouldn't have the concerns and consistency of the like count that was denormalized and the actual rows of the likes. I wouldn't have this concern, therefore I wouldn't create that behavior and encapsulate that in some aggregate or entities. And if I didn't have any other concerns about features related to events, I just wouldn't have gone down this road at all. It just would have kept as simple as it was from the very beginning. So I appreciate the original video, as mentioned, links in the description to it. But the thing I really wanna get across here is simplicity. Start with simple. When you look at these templates, you look at whatever the case may be, if it's illustrating something, realize the problem that it's actually solving. So many templates and demos, it's really kind of hard to illustrate that, what the problem is and what those patterns actually solve. Same thing goes with domain-driven design. If you see patterns, that doesn't mean it's actually domain-driven design. It means it's using a certain set of patterns. I'll have a video linked at the very end of this video that I think really just kind of describes the essence of domain-driven design because you can't get that just by looking at a sample. Lastly, the thing is you need to understand coupling and how coupling almost plays a part of everything. If you can foundationally understand that, you'll understand a lot of kind of these samples, clean architecture, how they're trying to get around, to not get around, but how they're guiding you in a certain way of dependencies. But it's if you have that problem. Understand your problem, 
understand the solutions, and don't be applying solutions blindly when you don't have those problems to begin with. If you have questions about topics like this around software architecture and design, or you have your own opinionated answers, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server. The link's in the description on how to join. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment, and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.